Hi, this is Rachel Grumwell, Director of Programming at JW3, and I'm speaking to you from the beautiful Howard Hall, uh, which unfortunately at the moment is empty. As you know, we had to close our doors on Monday evening, but we are very much open. As you know, JW3 is not a building. It's a beautiful building, but JW3 is a project with a vital mission and vision. And now more than ever, we want to bring stimulation, inspiration and comfort powered by Jewish values, learning and life into your homes. So we're working really hard on digital programming for the coming months. JW3 TV, as you will have seen. Meanwhile, we've uploaded some of the best of our archive content from the last six and a half years, so please enjoy. This content's free, but as you can imagine, this is a difficult time for us financially, so if you can donate to keep us going, to keep a uh, cross-communal space where everybody is welcome in play and healthy for the future, please do so. Enjoy! Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I wasn't sure if it was on or not, so it is. Um, still a few of you sitting down, that's fine. Um, welcome to JW3. For, thank you for coming to this event, which forms part of our ongoing Sunday Night Live series. Uh, my name's Will. I'm one of the arts and culture programmers here. And my colleagues and I are also quite excited, not only about tonight, but also about our upcoming September to December programming. So um, on the way out of the centre tonight, if you pick up one of the new brochures, there's hundreds of different activities for you and your families. Um, some really exciting things. So pick one up on the way out. Um, one of those events we've got coming up is the Hampstead and Highgate Literary Festival and that's running from the 22nd to the 26th of September. Um, the information on for that will be on the website very shortly um, and the names are being confirmed now but I'll give you a sneak preview. Uh, we've got some great guests coming including Diana Athill, Jay Rayner, Gillian Slovo, Ian Sinclair and Eddie Reader. Um, who I'm quite excited about. So keep checking the website for that, and that'll be a great four days of, uh, of literary information. Uh, but on to tonight, we have two great talkers to be tonight, two great speakers. We've got Anthony Kilvane, who was born in Leeds in 1960. He started life as a history teacher uh, before becoming a sports journalist. He's also an author, and his book, Promised Land, which won both Football Book of the Year and Sports Book of the Year in 2011. His second book, Does Your Rabbi Know You're Here, was shortlisted for the 2013 Football Book of the Year, and his new book, A Yorkshire Tragedy, uh, is out next month, and he will be returning to that aforementioned Hampstead and Highgate Literary Festival uh, next month to talk about it. And Howard Jacobson, uh, is who I'm sure you all know, who probably doesn't need an introduction, but I will give a couple of sentences. Um, an acerbic novelist with a passion for literature and art, um, his new book, Shylock is My Name, a novel, can be, um, can be purchased after the talk at the signing here. Um, and, and, it's, and it's just finished, I think, the run in Manchester at the um, Royal Exchange Theatre, where it's been getting rave reviews in the papers I've read. Um, I couldn't get up to see it, but I'm sure he'll mention it in the uh, conversation. Um, but it's his, it's his book, The Mighty Waltzer, which forms the start of tonight's event. Set in the 1950s Manchester Jewish community, it's the tale of a shy, bookish adolescent who channels his frustration into table tennis. It won the Bullinger Everyman Woodhouse Prize for comic writing and the Jewish Quarterly Literary Prize for fiction in 2000. And, and it's that which is, sorry, has just been on at Manchester, getting mixed up. Um, the Royal Exchange Theatre, where it's received the great reviews. Um, and without much further ado, I'll invite Howard and Anthony out to start tonight's talk. Thank you. Anthony Clavain, uh, as you've just heard, um, and this is Howard Jacobson, who obviously needs no introduction but has just had one. Um, and, and I should start by saying, Howard, that the reason why I was very keen to uh, have this conversation with you 
Well, and actually, these chairs, you know, have a bit of a The frightening thing is one could fall over the bed. <laughs> um, the reason I was very keen to have this conversation with you... <laughs> You're welcome to have a laugh, but we're not going to give you a laugh that way. <laughs> um, we might even have a game of ping-pong in a minute. When I started to write uh, this book called Does Your Rabbi Know You're Here? Um, some of you, I don't know, might have read it, but some of you might not have. I was inspired to write it because I had been reading it for years. I was reading uh, Coming From Behind, um, which is one of your early, I won't say early funny ones. It, because My were, first. Your first. Um, but also um, reading uh, The Mighty Walser, and I was reading Kaluki Nights as well. And I thought your attitude towards sport... Uh, and uh, Jewishness was very, very interesting, but it wasn't one that I subscribed to 100%, let's just say. I mean, there's, you know, the airplane joke where uh, the air stewardess uh, brings uh, to uh, a sort of Jewish lady, so, uh, she said, you know, I'd like to ha um, can I have so something to read, and the, the Jewish lady yeah. says, um, well, I just a little bit of light reading, and the, the air stewardess brings back a, uh, a leaflet and says, you know, this is the book of, of famous Jewish sports legends. In other words, you can fill just, you know, one A4 sheet of paper with famous Jewish sports legends. And I thought that you might have subscribed to that view, because I, your, your attitude towards football, for example, you know, it's not a Jewish game, or rather one of your characters uh, says this. And I was very surprised when I read the Mighty Walser, how obsessed the character Oliver Walser was, and therefore I read up on you how obsessed you were as a as a teenager growing up in Manchester. So it was you know, your attitude towards sport, I found, I wrote 80,000 words about Jews and sport, and I was kind of thinking, you know, Howard Jacobson would be possibly against it. I, I sort of changed my mind when I started to read those novels. Is your attitude towards sport you know, basically different now to, uh, to, to what it was then? It's very think? simple. My attitude towards sport is very simple. It's something that Jews don't do. <laughs> and when I encounter Jews that do, I'm accepting table tennis here. And we can talk about why table tennis is something other. But when I meet very few Jews at the school I went to, I went to a grammar school in the north of England and it was 15% Jewish. And none of, the, none of my Jewish friends played any sport. We didn't play football, we didn't play rugby. I mean, the idea of a Jew playing rugby. Um, we didn't do, we didn't play cricket. Um, and I would have thought that what, that what went with our not playing it was our not watching it. And I, and I felt it was some kind of secret that other Jewish boys had, that they would sneak off to watch Manchester City or Manchester United. And I didn't believe that they really did that because they got pleasure from it. I believed they were doing it because they felt they really ought to do it. And the difficulty I will, I, that I will have throughout this conversation is I, I won't believe you. I don't, not, not that I think you were lying, but I don't see how you can be in Jewish goes with, with any of that. Um, it was, for me, the, the whole business of playing games was a nightmare at school, and I went through school, seven years of being at grammar school, with a note in my back pocket <laughs> from my mother, saying that I had uh, a bilious attack. <laughs> there was something, you don't hear of people having bilious attacks anymore. It was a kind of 50s thing, bilious attacks. There must have been something in the water. I genuinely did have a bilious attack when I said I was having a bilious attack. And my mother was able to write a note saying he will not be able to play sport this afternoon because he will be having <laughs> Because she knew I would be having a bilious attack. Because I so much did not want to play games. I truly did not want to play games. It was winter all the time in Whitefield. And when we played football, the ground was always frost hard. And if you fell over, there were kind of, there were points, the, 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 the mud was pointed and you'd play games. It was winter all the time in Whitefield. And when we played football, the ground was always frost hard. And if you fell over, there were kind of, there were points, the, 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 the mud was pointed and you'd fall over and you'd bleed. It was my sense that for some reason, I mean no disrespect, 
Gentile boys didn't mind when they, when they bled. And Jewish boys did mind when they bled. And my mother did not like to see me. I suppose I now have to ask how my mother knew my legs were bleeding when I reached the age of short trousers, unless I showed her. So maybe I did roll my trousers up and show her, look, Ma, my, my legs are bleeding, because I wanted the pity. But table tennis, table ten, when table tennis came along, just to make the difference, my mother knew there was a difference between table tennis and other games because the minute, the minute, the minute it became clear I was going to be interested in table tennis and good at table tennis, she was excited because she couldn't see what harm I could come to. <laughs> the ball was not hard. It was a little, a little celluloid ball that couldn't hurt you. It was too big to take an eye out, but not big enough to hurt you in any other way. So I have to now um, challenge you in a, in, a, in a sort of friendly way, because I think that um, the idea, or may I say the myth of you know, Jewish boys not being into the physical side of sport, surely is, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be confrontational here, but A stereotype. stereotype. I am stereotyping the Jew. Is it not mythologizing? For example, the very idea of muscular Judaism, which you know, Matt Nordo, uh, invented in the late 19th century, the idea to get away from being a ghetto Jew and a feet Jew, you know, mummy's boy, if you like, and to bring them into the real world is almost what surely Oliver Walser's doing in this brilliant um, novel, The Mighty Walser. He's getting out of his shell as Jews got out of the ghetto. He got into the world and through football, rugby, but you know, let's also say boxing. I mean, how do you explain the number of Jewish boxers? Um, it's difficult. I know there yeah. were a lot. I, mean, when I, I researched sport when I was just to make sure I was right in saying there were no Jewish sportsmen and discovered there were lots of Jewish boxers. I don't know what you do with that. It might be that it was just there was something peculiar to the Jewish to the Jewish group I was growing. Maybe it was just Presswich Jews. Manchester Jews were like that. <laughs> But I didn't know a Jewish boxer. Yeah. I never met a Jewish boxer. I, ne I never met a Jew who wanted to play any... The only Jew I ever met who played anything that could be called a sport was me. <laughs> and it was table tennis. And it was table tennis that I played. And it was... It, uh, do you have ever met a Jew? Who here has ever met a Jewish gymnast? Or who here has There's ever a met a gymnast? The but you see, you're the, if there is one there, you are the exception that proves the rule. Gyms are not places, I don't mean gyms that you go to now to build yourself, but the PE place that we went to at school was not a place for Jews. And it was not a place for Jews for this reason. You shinned up ropes, and the gym teacher would say, have you ever seen a monkey climbing up a rope? A Jew does not do what a monkey does. When in Shylock, when in, when in The Merchant of Venice, Jessica, the runaway daughter, uh, goes off with a non-Jewish man. The, the, she goes off with the man that all Jewish fathers dread their daughters will go off with. She finds him, Lorenzo. She runs off to Genoa. She steals jewelry. She steals the mother's ring. And with the mother's ring, she sells the mother's ring in Genoa and she buys a monkey. With marvellous intuition, Shakespeare knows what a Jew would least want his daughter to do with the money that she's got from stealing the ring by a monkey. So you have, a Jew is, a monkey stands for everything that Jewish civilization does not stand for, unbridled sensuality and the physical life without thought or care. That's what you do with the, with the, with the, with the rope. And the other thing that they had in, 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 in the gym at school, our gym, was wall bars. And what you do in wall bars is you climb up the wall bars and then you hang upside down. <laughs> Jews don't hang upside down. And the reason, is it this my sound that's banging? And the reason Jews don't hang upside down is if you hang upside down, your brains are lower than the rest of your body. And when the Jew values brains too much for the brain for them ever to be lower than the rest of your body. That's my point about the physical life and Jews. The fact that there are a few Jewish boxers and one or two other Jews like yourself pretending to be interested in football doesn't, doesn't change things an awful lot. Where are the Jewish footballers? Where are your Jewish heroes in this game? That you well, can I say there's one of my heroes, David Fleet. Um, Football manager, anyone support Tottenham here? Silly question. Yeah. Yeah. You all remember David Pleat? He's Jewish. Yeah. Pleat. Yeah. <laughs> um, not only, in fact, 
his, his original name was Platz, and uh, uh, yeah. as you write so eloquently that um, you know you you accept the idea that one one day you are uh, Platz and the next minute you you wake up and you're Pleat, um, and that's part of secularisation. But you should remember David Pleat because he. Uh, I wrote a, a chapter in, in, in the book, uh, Does Your Rabbi Know You're Here? Sorry for the shameless self-promotion, but... Uh, and David Pleat rang me up very excitedly and said, you'll never guess, you'll never guess who I've just seen in um, a restaurant next to the Ritz, whose name I've still forgotten, but... Um, the Walsley. The Walsley. He said, you'll never guess who I've seen. I said, who? He said, Howard Jacobson. <laughs> and Howard Jacobson, he said, is a hero of mine. Uh, so he's a Jewish football manager, he's very well read, I suppose that's a bit stereotypical. He said, I went up to Howard Jacobson, I was sitting with David Dean. You know who David Dean is? No. <laughs> <laughs> is Dean a Jewish name now? So? <laughs> so, <laughs> David Sungjin Christian Dean, that, <laughs> that well-known Jewish... <laughs> Can you now tell me that was David Pleat that introduced himself? Yes, David Pleat introduced himself to you. He was sitting with David Dean, who basically has been running Arsenal for you know, 20, 25 years. Uh, you know who Arsenal are? It's another football team. That's right. And uh, he said, I'll, I went up to Howard and I asked him to sign a copy of, uh, not your book, my book. Which is, <laughs> that was a very strange experience. Do we know? Do we know who's got that? Book? Oh, Pleat, Pleat. And he said, "I've." For some reason, he asked you to sign a copy of my book. I said, "I can't do that. I never wrote that." <laughs> but you signed. But maybe he knew that I had essentially written that, in that my influence was so profound. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote eighty thousand words in a in an intellectual, uh, imaginary conversation with you, and he he obviously knew that. So he said to me. I, I got his. Uh, I got Howard to sign the book. I went back to the table where David Dean, who is basically one of the big machers of English football, and uh, and he said to David Dean, "You'll never guess who's just signed my book." Uh, David Dean said, "Who?" David Pleat said, "Howard Jacobson." David Dean said, "Howard who?" <laughs> but that also makes my point that there is an unbridgeable gap between the world of sport and the world of the world of. Jews. And yet, is it bridgeable through table tennis? This is what we are here to talk about. We're at a fantastic ping pong festival. We've got a, a, a table tennis table, a ping pong table. We might even have a, a knock in a minute if you feel. Uh, it might come to that. <laughs> because I, I was, you know, we talk about ping pong, we talk about table tennis. What was it about table tennis and ping pong? What was it that made it a, a Jewish sport? in the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, um, possibly coming to an end by the 1950s. What do you think really made table tennis a Jewish sport? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? There were, and, it and it is true, there were lots of very, but, though I could think of no Jewish sportsmen, and this is, this is true, I, 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 I had never heard of any significant Jewish sportsmen in Manchester when I was growing up. We had a load of Jewish table tennis players. There'd been a man called Hyman Lurie who'd played for England. There was Jeff Ingber, who was a hero of mine, very glamorous when I was just coming up in the game. Uh, he played for England. There was Benny Kozowski, he played for England. We had, we had playing just around, living in our street and playing around the court, we had international sportsmen. Not every little piddling around playing for little local clubs. International, international sports. Big names. Why so many Jews? The, game, the tables were accessible to us, that was part of it. The Jewish world that we'd grown up in, had no, we, we had no money, no one had any money. There weren't rich Jews then, really. We went to, so we made our own fun, as they say. And we went to those social clubs that had been set up at the beginning of the 20th century to keep by Jews who already existed in London and America to make sure that the new Ashkenazi Jews coming over had somewhere to go to, to keep them off the street, to give them something to do, snooker and always there was table tennis there, and in the hope that they would there meet Jew the Jewish boys would meet girls and so on. Um, so there were these places existed, but something, but more than that, something about the game appealed to the Jewish imagination, which is why the great players, the first world champion, um, even where they weren't Jewish, they were intellectuals. I think the first world champion, Jacoby, was a philologist. 
and a Dr. Jacobi. That's what made that wonderful. The first world champion table tennis player was a doctor. <laughs> so it was something else that ma made the game, game appeal to my mother. You can play table tennis <laughs> and not be a doctor. <laughs> And then the great players in Budapest and Vienna were all were all were all Jewish. Richard Bergman, I'm not sure Barna was Jewish, but so what was it about the game? I think it was the narrow space appealed to us. Maybe we'd all lived in ghettos too long, um, and we knew how to work in a narrow space. Maybe we enjoyed we enjoyed um, being being confined in that way. I was for a period of my life married to somebody who who wasn't Jewish. I make no apology. Someone, one has to do these things. <laughs> I have been. I, I mean, I, 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 so that I can report to you on the experience. I've been married to someone who was not Jewish. I've been married to someone who was half Jewish, and now I'm married to someone who is Jewish. So, if anybody wants to know the advantages of any, <laughs> and the non-Jewish person to whom I was married said, I, I can't believe when I go back to Manchester and things, you all huddle together. It must be a Jewish thing. You all kind of love being crowded and close together. So maybe this game, which is so different from tennis, mm. where you've got those open spaces, and this is indoor as well, appealed to something in our imaginations. But what also appealed to our imaginations, I think, was the wit of the game. Yeah. You're so close to your opponent, and you would read your opponent psychologically. Mm. I, I, because the play of my novel has recently been on in Manchester, I put on a little exhibition for the Manchester Jewish Museum to go with it, and we called it Chess in Shorts, because I thought that's what the game was like. And, you know, we, why are we so good in, at chess? That's another story, but it's a connected story. Mm. Uh, it was, it was as, as games, as sports goes, if it is a sport, it's unusually intellectual. Mm. Um, you, 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 you're you working in very, 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 very fine margins, which sounds almost economic, doesn't it? And um, I'm not saying that's the point of it. But you would fence, you would fence away with your opponent. It would be an intellectual, a game of table tennis was the nearest thing that you could have to an intellectual contest mm. outside of an intellectual contest. Mm. I think those are some of the reasons Jews liked the game and excelled in it until it then became another kind of game and Jews ah. suddenly stopped excelling. Well, that's an interesting one, because you excelled and Oliver Walter excels in a different time for table tennis, um, a time of the, uh, the hard bat, I think, um, and your legendary um, forehand chop, which you might feel, uh, you might want to demonstrate to us in a second, I don't know, your legendary forehand chop, I'm doing the right Action, no, that's a backhand. Sorry, <laughs> the legendary forehand shot yep. um, and, and backhand flick. Yep. That's right, isn't it? Um, they were in the novel uh, the, the the two kind of motions that really um, propelled Oliver to his great success. But surely uh, they are based on your own life. I mean, were you not uh, an outstanding table tennis player? I was a good table tennis player. I was a good junior table tennis player. I won cups. I was the Manchester junior, ju uh, the Manchester junior champion. I was going to say Jewish, but not Jewish. Manchester junior champion. I I beat Gentiles as well as as well as Jews. <laughs> um, and I played for Lancashire juniors, and I played for Manchester men, and I went to Cambridge and was a Cambridge blue. But I never made it as a senior player. I'd lost interest then, and other things happened and the game had changed and what changed the game was the, uh, the, the bats with which I played which were just pimple just fine rubber pimples on a on a wooden on a wooden blade um, suddenly became made of sponge um, and in 1953 I think it was at the Indian at the World Championships in Bombay I think um, someone called Ogimura who no one had ever heard of he was a Japanese um, Won the world, won the world championships. He'd come from nowhere, and he won it with a bat that looked like a mattress. The bat made no sound; it had no music anymore. The ball went incredibly quickly, and the sorts of ways we played the game before no longer, no longer worked. In fact, there's a there's a wonderful story. There's a man called, and if I if we do go on the table, I have a bat that he gave me. There's a man called Marty Reisman, who some of you may have heard of, who was an American player in the 40s and went to Bombay. He was a, a New York 
table tennis player. He was a table tennis player with chutzpah. He was, um, he was a showman, which no table tennis player in England, no Jewish table tennis player or non-Jewish table tennis player in England was. The game was introverted in England. In America, it, it, was, it was showtime. And um, he was not just a showman, but he was a, a great, great player. And he was expected to win the world championships in Bombay. And then there was the sponge bat and there was nothing he could do about it. From 1953 until almost the present, he died just a couple of years ago, he campaigned for the, the return of the, of the, of the hard bat. He organized hard bat table tennis tournaments all over America and all over the world and believed that he had been robbed because of the sponge, because of the sponge bat. And actually believed that the 1953 decision would be overturned. <laughs> he would ring me up at three o'clock in the morning, not knowing the difference, the time difference between America and here, and tell me that uh, Howard, I just want to tell you, um, I'm making some progress <laughs> with this. He never did, of course, make any progress with this. But for the whole of his life, and he remained a wonderful player with the hard bat. For the whole of his life, he believed that the sponge bat would be got rid of, and he wrote wonderfully about why it should have been got rid of that the wit went out of the game, that the music went out of the game, yeah. that with the hard bats, of course, you could read what kind of spin the other player was putting on the ball, how much, how hard he had hit it, and where it was going, you could hear it. So the game had a music, and once the sponge, just, you just went squelch, instead of plop, 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 it went squelch, squelch. This made the game high. Uh, again, then that the Japanese and the and the and the Jap and the and the Chinese excelled at. The Chinese still excel at it, but it's another kind of game. Yeah. Very athletic, twice as fast, but not chess in shorts anymore. Can I ask you a, a personal question? Um, I think a lot of the novel, which is semi-autobiographical, is about Oliver uh, being accepted about perhaps that being a metaphor for the wider issue of, of the Jews being accepted. Uh, you talk about acceptance quite a lot in the novel, and it's, it's this idea of wanting to um, prove a point. You know. and, um, and I've read in interviews elsewhere that you've also talked about, you know, you've been a, um, a brilliant writer, you are a brilliant writer, you continue to be. And yet, I think you were all, you, I think it might have been on Desert Island Discs when you said this, but maybe it was something about you wanting to prove a point as well. And when you won the, uh, the Man Booker Prize, um, perhaps, was that your moment, the equivalent of which might be, say, becoming you know, the world table tennis champion? Or was it that moment in which you thought, you know, I can relax a little, I've been accepted. Um, and although, you know, your, your novels since have been, you know, just as good, if not better than that, was that that moment which a lot of sportsmen talk about when they say, you know, we've, we've been expected, and Jewish boxers have talked about this, and Jewish footballers have talked about it, although there aren't that many, I know. Um, they talk about it, they've won, they've, they've proved their point, and they can relax. Is, was that, was I that thought I would be able to relax, and I relaxed for five minutes. <laughs> and um, are you, is a Jew accepted, not want to be accepted? Right. Would I feel I had been rendered impotent if I was suddenly accepted? If I'm out there fight, fighting, not, not boxing and not playing football, but if I'm out there intellectually sparring or doing whatever, whatever, is it any good for me to be accepted? Do I know how to behave if I am accepted? It was very odd when I won the book of Prize because in my ear I, I, I thought I heard, and then I, I saw it written about that there was a roar of pleasure. And I still puzzle about that roar of pleasure. Where did it come from? Because my mother and father weren't there, <laughs> friends of mine weren't there. Where did the? Because who could? Who would be wrong? I'm quite accepted, and I wouldn't be accepted by Jews either, because we don't quite do it. You know, there's always a little problem. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so non-acceptance is part of the deal, I think. Um, now, if you're saying is all this a metaphor for the whole business of being? accepted as a Jew. Well, maybe that's, that still holds. Can, can Jewishness ever be acceptable to the world now, given everything that's happened in it? I wrote another, another novel called Jay, and I spoke here about it mm -hmm. about three years ago, yeah. which is about the apparent necessity that the world has to get, get, get the Jew out, get the Jay out, get the Jay not spoken. 
um, be without be without Jewishness um, but for 2,000 years which is a bit tough but we also invented it and then according to another view oppose Christianity at the same time yeah. means means they get means they get us both ways because and I think that's it might be that in the end it's our giving Christianity to the world that's most feeling in the world that resents Christianity. Christianity is hard to resent openly. So if you can if you can resent the Jews, forgive me. Ninety nine, I think you were in Sydney at the time, and you were obviously a C. Mm -hmm. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand years of striving. But for Jewishness, I don't know what is. You're right. You did right. Thank you for explaining. <laughs> Can we now go to the others? <laughs> no, I think it's, I mean I think that's very very convincing. I remember writing that, but I don't remember thinking I was writing about Jew. I was just trying to remember what it was like dreaming of table tennis and having nightmares because I still occasionally have them. And, I, and since I don't play table tennis anymore, why would I have a nightmare about not being able to knock a ball past a person unless it stands for something else? And I think you, mm. I seriously think yeah. you've nailed it. That's it. <laughs> but the ball coming back, I mean, I, lo I love that idea. And we don't want to get onto this too much, but in the last few years, the ball seems to be coming back in terms of, I don't know, anti-Semitism. Um, I think we felt for a long time that you know, we'd been through, we were, we were sort of a beetroot farmers and then we were, you know, market men and women and then we were, you know, educated and we, we were, you know, writers and, and even footballers, believe it or not. And then we could relax and we were living a kind of secular, middle class uh, idyll. And, and yet the ball keeps coming back. And that's why I was reading into it because I'm reading it, you know, retrospectively. I mean, I know it's written in 1999, but I'm reading it in 2016. And I feel the ball is, you know, coming back. And we don't know where it's coming back from. It's coming from, you know, different places. It's not coming from the right wing, which we, you know, you grew up in Manchester and the black shirts were there. And you, you knew where the ball was coming from. And now we're thinking, you know, what's going on? I mean, the recent, uh, you know, Labour Party controversy. It was like strange to see anti-Semitic tropes uh, occurring in the, in the We whole, must be wrong. Left. We must be wrong because Lady Chakrabarty says we were. <laughs> and then so gone. there could have been no anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And the fact that she's been given that knighthood proves that she was telling the truth. <laughs> so nothing to see there. Absolutely nothing to see. But these, uh, these anti-Semitic tropes are recurring, uh, you know, across society. And, and you yeah. wrote in the New European as well about the, I thought it was interesting about the, 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 the mob, the fear of the mob. Did you, do you feel that now that the, the, um, maybe there was a period when we were accepted and, and you could relax and perhaps now, once again, we've got to keep worrying about where the ball's coming from and we've got to keep, uh, you know, our, our, we've, we've, we've got to keep practicing our forehand chops and our backhand flicks? Yeah, I don't think Jews can ever relax. By which I mean, I don't mean we are physically incapable of relaxing. But it might be we are physically incapable of relaxing. I certainly come from a family that was physically incapable of relaxing, and I'm physically incapable of relaxing. But whether morally and ethically and spiritually we should relax, that's something I'm not sure we ever should, because I don't think the world will ever be a safe place for Jews. This is, this is a dismal thing to say in one way, but it's also something that's kept us very agile, intellectually agile, and capable of producing marvelous things because we know we, always, we know we always have to. There isn't a moment in which Jews, I think, can just say, well, we'll, we'll hang up our boots now. We've done what we have to do. We are on the key leave. Um, looking for trouble, maybe looking for more trouble than there is. There's always, there's always going to be the, a degree when you've been a minority of imagining, of imagining persecutions that aren't there. But just because we sometimes imagine, imagine persecutions that aren't there doesn't mean that there aren't persecutions there. Are there? One of my, one of the people that I played table tennis with, a boy called, it's not a boy now, he's an old man now, called Barry Feinberg, um, and he's Eishki ah. in, he's Eishki in the, um, in the book, um, and I met him again when I, when, when the novel was published, and um, there was a Samuel Winbrand made a South Bank program about, about the novel. They went looking for some of the people that I'd played table tennis with and found them again. Actually, I'd already found one or two. These were people I hadn't seen since 1955, and then suddenly in 2000, we were looking for them or finding them again, and I found Barry Feinberg. 
and I asked him if he played and he said no I don't play anymore and he said and I said what do you do he said I um, I worry about the future of the Jews and I read about the Holocaust uh, and that's what he does I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen him now in 15 years again and I don't know if he's still alive but if he is he will be reading about the Holocaust and that's kind of that's where table tennis goes when mm. you can't play it anymore mm. I mean just finally I think from me, because I think it would be uh, nice to throw throw it open to the audience. Do you think this was a golden age then? I mean, the post-war era, um, when there were, I think, table, uh, table tennis players growing out of trees, I think that's the way you describe it in Manchester. Was this a golden age for ping pong, you know, Jewish ping pong, uh, the Jews in, in Manchester? Um, it was a... It, oh, oh, are we in danger of romanticising this? Or do you generally, you know, it's the age of the hard bat rather than the sponge. It's the age of, um, you know, Jews sort of striving to prove themselves, earning the respect of men and the love of women. Is that a period you look back on and think that was the golden age? Yeah. I was as miserable as Sid <laughs> during every day of it, but that's got nothing to do with it. It was a golden age, not just for Jews, but for everybody. We just... Nobody had much money, and that was quite good. Um, the greed that's, the greed that's, I mean, people have always been ambitious and wanted money, but the greed that was to come to characterize our society had not yet shown itself in that way. We didn't have city boys in that way. We didn't have the, the curse of the internet, which people say, you know, brings in many benefits. Sure it does, but it has given us, the, 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 what, the, what the internet has given us has been, you know, the social media which one day the world will say the worst thing that ever happened to civilization, worse even than the Jews in the social media. Because <laughs> the social media enabled the mob mm. to feel it had a voice. Yeah. I get people, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't Twitter or I don't, I don't tweet or do any of those things. I don't go on Facebook. I would not see the point. But every now and then, out of some perverse need, perhaps, to be persecuted, <laughs> I just go and have a look at the things that get said out there, and it is astounding what gets said. I mean, there are people out there who don't possess verbs, who don't know how to punctuate. I think they are entitled to have a verdict on my books. They give it stars. There are people, there are people who say, you know, I think this is worth one star. There are people who go, this, th this fellow uses words I've never read before, and again, they think that's a kind of mark against it. And out there, and that's just, that's just me spending five minutes looking at, at people being stupid about me, and the whole world where people are being stupid about everything. This is a terrifying world of the empowerment of the, of the illiterate, the uneducated. Uh, I think I said in that article in, um, for the, the New European, European. That we, I mean, we all have to believe in, we have to pretend to believe in democracy, because everything else is worse. But nobody can seriously think about democracy without knowing that there comes a moment when out of democracy comes the mob, mm. and the mob frightens me much more than the opposite of, of, of the mob. Mm. And el elites might be horrible things, yeah. but mobs are much more dangerous and far worse. So we didn't have the empowerment of the mob then. We knew that we had to, with the schools, the grammar schools that, that I and my friends went to were places that taught you that you had to be educated before you had the right to an opinion. Now people think they've got the right to an opinion. Actually, people do not have a right. Well, they have a right to an opinion, but they don't have a right to express it. And they don't know the difference between opinion and judgment. This was one of the ways in which the world we lived in then was nice. It was secular. The Manchester of the late 40s and the 50s, to be Jewish in particularly, was lovely. People knew, you didn't have to be, there wasn't an orthodoxy. I hate orthodoxies, by which I don't just, I don't mean I hate orthodox Jews, I hate orthodoxy of any kind. I was brought up, I was educated in a critical tradition. Jews are naturally critical people. We like disputatiousness, and you can't have orthodoxy and disputatiousness. Disputatiousness assumes the idea of heterodoxy, that we are always arguing, that we're always trying to reach a truth that there is no finished truth, it's not over. Orthodoxy assumes that something is over and we are now obedient to an orthodox truth. This wasn't around much in the Manchester I grew up in. As far as Jewish orthodoxy was concerned, it existed in two streets. My dad used to drive us up and down so that we would look at these people, not to laugh at them, but he just thought it was a good idea that we should see this other form that Judaism took. 
And I, 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 I was quite shocked by it. Now when you go to Manchester, you see the black hats in the area of Manchester I used to live in. I know some of those people. They are very good, honourable, spiritual people, but they are orthodox. They have stopped thinking for themselves. And what was lovely about the, the, the secular Manchester I grew up in, whether you were Jewish or not, but let's say, let's just talk about being Jewish. You thought for yourself. We, still, we had bar mitzvahs. We were circumcised. Our parents went to pieces when we went out with, with uh, non-Jewish girls or, or boys. And they, they didn't like it when we married out. All those things were still firm. Many of the you know, kids learn Hebrew. They went to shoot. We had a strong consciousness of what being Jewish was. But, it were, but orthodoxy didn't swamp us. We were still free and easy and open-minded. And, and I could talk about this for a long time. But yes, it was a wonderful, wonderful time, I think, the 50s. I longed for the 50s. But as I said at the beginning, I was miserable for every few. <laughs> Just to sort of round that up by talking and bringing it back to people, the idea of the, the, the golden era of the, the 1950s, uh, when we, I think you said when we were in between, we were, uh, we, we were peddlers and we weren't peddlers, you know, we were um, uh, swagmen and we were uh, not yet philosophers. That kind of transition, that moment, which will never come back, sadly, it's, it's a sort of a lament, really, the mighty also, isn't it, for that period? Yes. And it's a very, very positive book in that sense. And I know that, you know, obviously, the, the diaspora of Jay, uh, it's a tremendous, uh, but, it, but, a dysto but it's a dystopian novel. And I really, after reading Jay, and I went back to the Mighty Walls, I, I felt, you know, this was a lament for a better time when people were better and table tennis was better. <laughs> yes, and, and I like what you've gone and done now and made me understand that, you know, table tennis stands for much more than itself in that book. So thank you for that. Well, that's okay. Do you, do you fancy a knock? Yeah. You don't have to. Well, I don't know. Kind of, it's a bit embarrassing. I know. I mean, can we take questions yes. from, while we're having a knock? You brought your. <laughs> can you explain? You brought your bat, haven't you? Which is this is my this is my this is a bat given to me by Marty Reisman, the person I was talking to about before, who believed that he should forever. Um, he was ever owed the 1953 world title. And what was interesting about Marty Reisman is he had a Japanese wife. Well, there are lots of interesting about Marty Rich. But he had a Japanese wife who, before every match, would clean the table for him in that Japanese way. And after every match, would clean the table. And she went all over the world with it. This was in his later years, while he was still playing hardback. Um, and it was only at one point that I realised she never, ever knew that he'd lost. <laughs> she never knew. She just assumed he won every match. <laughs> and he never told her otherwise. <laughs> But he, he was from the Lower East Side in New York, and the way that they play uh, table tennis is different to, say, the Manchester way or the British way. So are you going to... I don't know whether you can play with one of those. Well, if I lose, I'll use it as an excuse. So, so are we taking questions, meanwhile? Because we can't just stand here and play. <laughs> um, after the first point is won, I'm sure by you... Well, we're just, take, we're we're just knocking questions. around, as we say. We aren't going to... Oh, stop. <laughs> Very good. The chop that you were talking about, this chop. is the chop sir. Oh. I'm, I'm being... Um... And then this is the backhand spin sir, which will mean you will put the ball over there. <laughs> anyway, I think we'll now take questions. <laughs> oh, but you should have seen me in my youth. <laughs> I've been, I've been um, toyed with by a, a master, and um, well, we did talk about it before. And I said, yeah. "Can you play?" And you said, "Yes." <laughs> I was lying. And, it, and this lying. is causing you now to wonder about your bona fides as an expert on football. <laughs> See, after the compliment of uh, saying you, you made you you understood about table tennis and Jewishness from my book, you've now delivered the kind of intellectual, uh, unplayable. I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> but um, I, would, I wondered if there were any questions from the audience. Uh, I see I had uh, lots of hands, yes. So there's a, there's a roving mic and there's a lady at the back. Yes. 
Yeah, I just want to say how I, I mean, I grew up in a very similar home than you did. We had a ping pong table. Where are you? I can't see. I'm here. Oh. We had a ping pong table, and there was never sports on, ever. And my father was relieved that he had two girls because he was always terrified there might be a boy in the house who wanted to play football with him. So after me, there would be no more children, just in case. So it was a very similar home. So I grew up without any sport whatsoever. And then I, I married my Gentile sports journalist husband. Life just fell away and, um, <laughs> and suddenly, I found something. I, I agreed with you. I thought Jews and sports never mixed. But then I realized, like through my husband's mates, that most sports journalists were the ones that I met were all Jewish. Yes. I mean, I could list Absolutely. them myself. You know, Simon Cooper. Yeah. Brian Glanville. Simon Inglis, Matthew Engels, you know, my husband. Sorry, he should be talking. <laughs> I'll talk. And um, so he added to the sports page, all the sports writers were Jewish. Well, and that's then, not. Go on. Wait, hang on. And then. <laughs> talked about sport, but suddenly sport was always up for conversation. Every Jew I knew, every, well, more Jewish men, were football fans. So my question, I, I was very curious tonight to find out what is it about Jewish men? They are completely football mad. I mean, they might not play the game, but they're football mad. They're writing about football. They're writing like yourself, writing books about football. And that's what I was curious about. What it is about Maybe it's just, they just want to write about the sport and watch the sport from the outside. No, I don't know. But it, it's... it's well, you've nice. answered the question yourself. They have, turned a, they have turned a physical activity into a mental act. <laughs> <laughs> they write about it. And of course that's what we do, is we aren't hermits. We accept the materialism of and we will and we will, we will write about it. But it is about, it's also partly, there's a kind of masochism. There's a, there's a moral and intellectual masochism in, to, in, in turning your the, I, I, I spotted masochism and sport in Manchester when I discovered that most of the Jews in Manchester, but what was the support then? What was the point then of supporting Manchester City that they could go, oh, what a day we've had in the field. Oh, how did the team do? I can't show it. Oh, oh. And I think, and I think the business of being the Jewish, of being that all I can, all I can ever hope to do is write about. They're all quite sad. These Jewish sports. <laughs> well, the oldest and greatest of football writers is Brian Glanville. Yes, he's a good writer. Who's been writing for seven or eight. Um, and uh, yes, I mean he, he is the sort of doyen of all doyens. But you have this phrase in your uh, novel, The Mighty Walter, which you said there was a perversity in enjoying the pain of fun and the pain of losing. It was almost preferable to winning. I sport whatsoever, but my wife will tell you that I sit in front of a time when I could have given you the, the name of every member of the New Zealand women. <laughs> and I watched dart. I watched the top 10 darts players and things. And um, I don't want to get onto that. Well, hold on, you don't... There are any Jewish darts players, but I, I came at this in a very particular way. And I losing, forgot. I think you, you kind of value... Is, is, is tennis. And, uh, and I've watched the, the tussle between Andy Murray and an exception to this rule, because he has the air. I mean, that's like watching something bodied running around, running around a court what? to want to win. Wanting to win means you don't want to know the experience. Boss is philosophically a much, a much richer thing, a much more humane thing. Um, you think about your best friends, and I bet the people you like most are people who lose rather than people who win. You want to know people who win. <laughs> They're, they're all mad. They're all mad. They're obsessed from you know, their training, their devotion, their focus, being in the zone. I suppose being in the zone is not what a, Jew, a Jewish person is. Do you know a Jew has been in the zone? No. <laughs> and then when you talk to these sports people, they, you, I mean, you ask a sports person how, how they are and they tell you. <laughs> they tell you for hours they tell you about how their injuries are going. I mean, there's nothing in the world more boring than to sort of than to discover there's no darts on at the moment and there's no New Zealand women's bowls on at the moment. So you actually have to watch somebody interviewing a woman marathon runner who's had an injury and she starts to tell you about her. I mean, it's beyond belief. <laughs> and the assumption is that the whole world is interested in that. That's something or other that was done. I mean, it's. There's nothing sicker. Yeah, Whereas get a nice Jewish marathon runner, yeah, well, I ran half a mile and I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
saw a nice wine bar. I stopped up there. Yeah. They do a very good Shiraz there. I came back on. And you've got a story. Just winners don't have a story. Losers have a story. Excellent. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman there with his hand up and a blue shirt. And sorry if you just wait for the mic. Okay, I can for Jake. Uh, Sir Jacobson, um, presumably girls didn't get a look in at table tennis. Was this a boon to romance? Uh, they did actually. They did. There's in my in, in my novel there is a there is a, uh, a girl called Lorna, a young woman called Lorna Peachley, um, <coughs> who was based on a. Uh, I can't remember her real name, but I think it probably was Lorna, and she came from Cheshire, and Cheshire had a special kind of resonance. Um, and we would all, you know, we would we would all lose um, tournaments if we knew Lorna Peachley was playing later in the day, later in the day, so that we could have a chance to watch her. And uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful sight. Um, actually, you don't want to hear me say that she was a wonderful ten table tennis player, a excellent table tennis player, and Hayden Jones. Was uh, who then who won Wimbledon was a marvelous table tennis player, and she could she was as good as you know as anybody. I think she had a world a world title, certainly a doubles title. You no know, women did women women did play, and and yes, occasionally you you um, you fell in love with a woman table tennis player. But, but to take up the gentleman's point, you in, in the novel Oliver Walser enjoys losing deliberately loses to Lorna Peachley. Um, in order to have, how can we put this, uh, have his way with her? I mean, she certainly was attracted to him, and by <coughs> deliberately throwing a match, he managed to uh, get her attention. But he also makes her ill, and she makes a very eloquent play in my novel, and did in the play too. The play was very good, actually. I didn't write it, but um, the, to have somebody putting that pressure on you, to have somebody who wants to lose to you all the time, she didn't get the particular voluptuous Thing that you were describing, she couldn't kind of understand that because she wasn't Jewish. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I think there's a, a chap at the back, right at the back there. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your talking. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, talking about masochism, um, I'm, I'm a football fan and I'm also a table tennis player. I'm a Coventry City supporter. And in 46 years, I've been watching them, and they've never finished in the top six of any football league. And that is masochism, I can assure you. And uh, I know that Anthony feels as strongly about Leeds, but they would certainly be more successful. Um, I'd just like to ask you about table tennis. One of my greatest experiences was playing for Scotland in the Maccabea. I've done that twice at table tennis. And it was a, a fantastic experience. I've done it in Vienna, Berlin, and in uh, Israel. And I wondered whether or not you ever had the opportunity of playing in the Maccabea table tennis. No, I never did. I mean, I, you must have been very good. Um, I either wasn't good enough. I think I probably wasn't good enough. The person who um, I, be, I played on the same team as Jeff Ingber, who you might know, or you may have encountered you were younger, I think when you were a lot younger. But he was the great table tennis, Jewish table tennis player from Manchester. He did play in the Maccabee. It was a very high standard. I, um, I didn't. I ne I'm ashamed to say I never attained. That's never attained that standard. It wasn't that good. But, I, but well done, you. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Still don't understand the Coventry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Coventry. Or rather, City I understand it too well. <laughs> Coventry City, um, Sky Blues, and. Um, they weren't managed by David Pleat, but they, I thought they, they, they won the FA Cup, didn't they, in 1987? That's Be, after beating Leeds in the, the semi-final. Oh God, you know things like that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a way of passing time until we have the, the next uh, question. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, that um, you're so entertaining, it's wonderful to listen to you. But just to mention that it was very nostalgic for me to listen to the beginning of your evening, um, because I recollect um, when I was at uh, grammar school and we had sports for females, um, my female medical condition, instead of lasting once a month, lasted four times a month. And I also carried my mother's note in my pocket wherever I went. The Jewish well, note. Yes. Did we know, no, well, no, we wouldn't have known each other, I'm too, I'm too old. What a good time we could have had reading each other's notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and there's a gentleman with his hand up at the back with a T-shirt. Um, I think this is what David Dimbleby has to do in the question time audience. I'm not very good at it. Sorry, sir. Yes, you at the back. And then, and then you, sir. Can go. And then there's a lady at the back. Uh, this is Jacobson. Um, as somebody that I would ask to explain what the British Jewish mentality, paranoia, living on the edge of us to those who aren't British Jewish paranoids, I couldn't pick a person better than you and I love you to death. I suspect I would not want you to speak to any Jewish child about their sporting career. <laughs> Having played in three Maccabee games in rugby, I'm not a footballer, I can't stand the game. I, I'm mystified by your acceptance of the stereotype, but more so your wish to pass it on to the next generation. How would you be in front of a, a bunch of fifth formers and talking about their sporting careers in school? Well, I wouldn't talk about their sporting careers. I would, I would try to... If they asked you about their sports at school. <laughs> I'd say forget about it and read the late novels of Henry James. <laughs> And then if they said, well, why can't we do both? Which we do. Would, and I would admit myself defeated and say I'm very pleased to hear it. And uh, I, I mean, the point about the stereotype, I absolutely uh, I accept that. I see what it is that I'm doing. Um, and there's a problem with stereotypes because we can't really live without them. One of the if, if I was not really well, allowed... Let's let others impose them upon us sometimes. No, but that means they win. And if we accept, once you accept a stereotype, you and once heart. you accept a stereotype and turn and make it into comedy, because that, what is a Jewish do joke but the acceptance of the Jewish stereotype in which we possess what other people would wish upon us? A Jewish joke is a masochistic thing in that way, and that we accept we are the way people say, and we then deal with it and twist it and bend it and become victorious at the end. There's no Jewish joke that isn't that isn't um, presaged. On a, that's not the word I'm looking for. There is no Jewish joke that isn't built upon um, ideas of Jews being, you know, cowards or greedy or you know any of those things. And what we do is we turn those things and we make those things ours. And we say to those who would visit these stereotypes on us, look how we possess them, and look how, in the end, how much cleverer than we are, we we are than you are when we do these things. Which, of course, is just another stereotype of the of. of the, the I'm sorry, I don't think we can operate. In the back of the games, let's not downplay our own ability for sporting achievements. Absolutely not, and I uh, and I admire you both. I don't know what all these people who played in the Maccabee games are doing shrieking at the back of the room. <laughs> I have to ask you what that means. Why you're not sitting here at the front carrying your flags. What just what is it you're ashamed of? <laughs> but you know, I, I salute you and I think it's terrific that you, that you did that. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, um, there's a gentleman there. And then we'll, we'll go to the lady. <coughs> just going back to your comment about social media, Mark Zuckerberg, who basically invented Facebook, or he's got it on the ground as a Jew, as you know, and his right hand woman is Cheryl Sandberg, who's also a Jew. Do you expect at some point that there will be comments, global comments, that the Jews are taking over what is now media, which I mean has already been discussed, but Facebook as a powerful media with 1.3 billion people daily using it, which I think is quite surprising it hasn't been linked yet. Do you see that coming? Well, I suppose it's so many people like it that they can't blame a Jew for it at the moment. But, uh, but it, um, to discover that makes me quite anti-Semitic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of all the things Jews could do, did they have to do that? Did they have to come up with that trash? I don't like it. Uh, no, don't let me go there. I'll, I'll go through all the Jews I don't like who are responsible for trash. But I do think that we are, you know, we are, we are, I, I aggrandize us. I think we are, we are, we are put upon the earth to do something special. I don't mind it when Jews say we are to be a light among, uh, to, we are to be a light to other nations. We don't always succeed, and we certainly don't succeed when we invent Facebook. It's a shame. It's a shame we've been, it's a shame that Jews are so good at those things. Because of all things that I'd like Jews not to want to know anything about or be good at, it's social media. <laughs> Something in the Talmud about it. <laughs> the lady at the back there. Um, not a lady, but never mind. I'm, I'm really sorry, it's dark, I can't see. I do apologise. Sorry, sorry. The one thing we do know is that, you, is that you were in the Maccabean game. <laughs> 
I think I'm one of the exceptions here. I'm one of the only men who has absolutely no interest in sport, despite my father and his friends and relatives coming out of the, the 30s and 40s and 50s and being completely sport balmy. So there's a pile of inverted stereotypes going on there. But the reason I said that is that the one thing that really got me about the mighty Walter at the Royal Exchange was, I mean, was something that was missing that you had in your novel. I didn't get the sense of the excitement of the game. I really wished to see the script developed into a film so we could really enjoy that that speed and that, that skill that you just demonstrated. But that's not my question, Howard. That was just a bit of schmooze. My question... Oh my God, what's the question? <laughs> simple. That's you smooth. said how much you longed for the 50s. And I do too. But so does Theresa May. And the, the love a lot of us have of our grammar schools because we happen to go to them may not be the appropriate thing now. I just wondered how you felt about these things coming round again and whether the grammar school in, um, that we enjoyed and mainly benefited from is necessarily the best thing for now. Um, there's lots there. I mean, I, what you said about the mighty once at the beginning was quite interesting, and I felt that a little. And, I, and it was discussed, actually. It was very, very difficult to do in a theatre in the round to create the whole table tennis thing. Fantastically difficult to do. There was a, there was a film script. Um, there, there exists a film script of the Mighty Waltz, and it very nearly was made into a film. And as I remember, it's a good script about the excitement of table tennis, but it never was made into that film. Various things went wrong, so who knows, it might once. But I agree with you, that was very, very hard. I'm not, I'm not saying there were any failures, but that would be a very, very difficult thing to get, that. Um, but grammar schools, I'm an, an old elitist. Um, I think I had a fantastic education at a, at a grammar school. Um, I know that there were people um, contemporaries of mine who weren't at a grammar school and didn't have the advantages uh, I had. Um, but since the closing of the grammar school, no one's had the advantages that I had. And I find it hard to square that with anything. Um, it would be wonderful if everybody could go to a grammar school. If everybody could go to a school as good as the school that I went to, and there were lots of people who, who were at my school who didn't think it was that good, but I thought it was terrific, although I was miserable every day. <laughs> and they made me hang up upside down on wall bars. When they weren't doing that, it was an excellent school. And if everybody can't have that advantage, I don't see why some people shouldn't have that advantage. And it was a real advantage. We were taught to read. And there's no, for me, there is, of course, it's my profession, reading and writing, there is no greater gift. It is perfectly clear to me um, that people are no, not in every case, but no longer being taught how to read. There's no leisure give, being given to reading. And, um, and grammar schools that would bring back composition, that, it, that would and even ask kids to read whole books, which they don't do now. I've talked to students who are doing Shakespeare in fourth year. And I say, well, you know, they, they, you're very interesting about Act 3, what about Act 5? We don't do Act 5. <laughs> um, and I have taught um, briefly at, at comprehensive schools, um, and they were terrible. They were absolutely terrible compared to grammar schools. Bring them back. We'll talk um, about this afterwards. Uh, yes, so uh, gentleman down there with the blue shirt, um, and then then we'll go to the lady at the back. Mr. Jacob, I grew up in the Liverpool Jewish community and I share all your very, very happy memories of Northern life. But you told us you were miserable. You haven't told us why you were miserable. Apart from hanging upside down in the box. Oh, temperament. <laughs> Just temperament. I was being, I was being called. I had the artist's call not to be grand about it. Artists are mainly miserable. You're not going to be an artist. You're not going to be a painter or particularly you're not going to be a writer unless you are miserable. If you are well happy and well adjusted, you'll probably end up playing football. <laughs> <laughs> what makes a writer is a sense of the, of the disappointment of the world, uh, its inadequacy to your hopes and expectations and your inadequacy to it. And so you set about recreating the world doing what, you know, making a better job of the world, if you like, um, than God did. Um, a novel is a critical act, 
You're not going to. You're not going to be able. To, you're not going to be capable of a critical act unless you are. Unless um, a profound dissatisfaction sits upon you every day of your life. That's the price you pay um, for being a musician or a painter or a writer. And I'm, you know, perfectly happy to have paid it. What's 25 years of misery <laughs> compared to being able to do this? And uh, lady there. Thank you. Oh, it's been very interesting listening to your table tennis um, uh, times. Uh, and just to say that I had a completely misspent youth playing table tennis. You have a completely what? Sorry? Misspent youth playing table tennis in London. There's a big group of Jewish people, boys and girls in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, who all played. It took over my life completely and I fully understand the whole self-flagellation about losing, beating yourself up. I played with two wonderful uh, men, actually older than me, sort of 20, 30 years, and sadly one of them passed away. And the way they used to self-flagellate, calling themselves schmerls every time they missed a shot, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. Uh, and again, I was fortunate enough to go to the Beer Games and play table tennis, and it's a marvelous, marvelous experience. But there are women as well who had the same experience and can really relate to it, so thank you for sharing that. It's lovely to hear the word schmeril again, I forgot the schmeril. But I'm also now humiliated to think that I've been on this table and demonstrated one of the naffest serves now in front of people who played at the Maccabean Games. Well, I can do better than that. I, once upon a time, I could have done better. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I bet. You were playing against the schmeril. Um, and also in the novel... You mustn't punish yourself like that. <laughs> in the novel, the, one of my favourite scenes, uh, I hope it's in the play, was uh, when you, or well, sorry, I shouldn't say you, when Oli, Oliver goes to the Akiva um, club for the first time, and there are all these uh, incredible characters, and he goes back home and his mum says to him, what was it like? He said, there was something wrong with them all. You know, was, all, every one of them had something wrong with them. And, um, and you, you've got Aishki, you've got uh, Sheeny Waxman, uh, you've got um, Gershom Finkel, um, you know, just the very names, uh, you know, just, just to talk about the names is sort of bringing back a, a, a different world altogether. But they would go around, you know, beating, flagellating themselves, calling themselves all sorts of names. They were all kind of eccentrics, um, they were odd, they weren't particularly pleasant to you at the beginning. And yet, you sort of look back on that and you say, you know, that was a magnificent moment of fellowship, of warmth, of community. And Fellowship in Schmeraldum. <laughs> There's something very special. There is something very special. But I'll tell you something, and though this might cut against, well, it doesn't really, because your point about the, 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 the metaphor for things Jewish is, I really do think is very good. But that when, when this novel came out, and, and people were, were reading it in 2000, many people came up to me and said, you've told my story. And it's very nice for a writer to hear that, because... Um, that's not always what you do. And I, say, and I would say every time, oh, you were a table tennis player. And often they would say no. <laughs> but they did something else that took them into the land of Schmerls. <laughs> and that was just something that wasn't popular. Something that, you know, that, what, that wasn't like football. Something that only a few people did. And they gave, and there's something about giving your life, giving, or certainly a long, a big stretch of your life, to something that nobody else cares about that will not get you anywhere, that's, that binds people in a particular way. After all, remember, the part of the, the joke of The Mighty Waltzer is that it's a kind of, it's, mo it's a mock heroic novel. Oliver believes that he will be the greatest table tennis player in the world, as a consequence of which he will um, attain um, undreamt of wealth um, and attract the attention of beautiful women. Well, nothing could be more unlike what awaits you. I mean, the, you know, his tragedy is not only that he doesn't become that greatest table tennis player, but even if he had, none of the things that he hoped for would have uh, would have eventuated. I mean, if I ask you, the pe people here, name your, your, you know, who are your favourite ten current table tennis players? <laughs> who are the ones you dream of, of, of waking up in the arms of? <laughs> No one gives a no one gives a damn about about that, which makes it sad, and also makes it no one still gives a damn about table tennis. 
But that's what people felt that they read in the book, that it was a kind of hymn also to giving your life to something which has no value, really, except in the giving your life to it and in the companionship that you... Mm. I mean, presumably, it's a bit like this if you, if you, if you watch aeroplanes take off. <laughs> they must drive home together and they must go, what plane did you see? Shh, Meryl, I missed that plane. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't get Jewish train spotters as well. I mean, oh, do you? Sorry. <laughs> Aren't you the one that went to the Maccabee again? <laughs> And, uh, of course, the mighty Walter, in the end, discovers that he wasn't that mighty and he wasn't that good and he, he was the so-so Walter. And, but that, there's also a kind of um, a sense that you, you know, you, you've rewritten your past, you thought you won games when you lost them, you thought you lost games when you won them, um, but he finds a kind of peace at the end. And the very last, I mean, I, that's a spoiler if I talk about the last lines. They've all read it. Okay. <laughs> is, is when Lorna, uh, f uh, after all these years, the, the fantastic Lorna Peachley, uh, who he hadn't recognised, Ollie, um, and thinks doesn't recognise him. She's married um, um, one, you know, one of the players, I think, from, not Akiva, but from the other, Hag Hag Haganah. Probably. Yeah. That um, sounds the, the joke, yeah. And then at the end, <laughs> He's the great love of his life, and he thinks hasn't recognised him. But then, she sort of a bit like the theatre, like this. He sits down um, to watch, and she can, she ruffles his hair, and he feels that. And it's not the the ruffling of you know we were once in love, and and, and I don't forgive you for the pain. It's it's uh, the the ruffling of the hair of acceptance of, of being remembered. And you say that's all we really wanted was to be remembered. And again, is that is that a similar thing? I mean, you say that's the waltzes, that's all we wanted to do was to be remembered. Um, interesting sort of last line of the novel. Well, it's all about how you temper your ambitions, really, and how you think about what your ambitions are for and what do you really, what do you really want. I was thinking of my father, partly. The, the mighty waltz that begins with a father doing, um, in, in, um, creating the biggest yo-yo in the world and competing in the World Yo-Yo Championships, which were held in Manchester in the middle 30s. And this fantastic yo-yo, this is a uh, more or less true story about what my father did when he was a young man. He worked on this huge yo-yo. It's fantastic. It was going to be the greatest yo-yo ever. He wasn't going to have any of these little bloody things. He had this marvellous engineered yo-yo. And he could make things. He was good with his hands, my father. And he went to the yo-yo championship and threw it down and it just stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, move, didn't, didn't, didn't come up. But he dreamed of being, you know, the greatest, the greatest yo-yo player ever. But, but, but essentially what he wanted was for people, he didn't really want to be the greatest at anything. He wanted, he wanted affection. Mm. And it would drive me mad as a boy to see, you know, how much it mattered to my father to be loved. Why do you want to be loved so much? Mm. Why is that so... But you kind of get that a little bit more later on. Mm. That, um, that, effect, that to be that to be held in a, in warm esteem mm. by people, that to have people fond of you, is 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 not a nothing. It's a it's a big it's a big something. Maybe winning the man booker was that that moment for you? Yeah, but yes, it was something. Yes, it was. It was. Mm. It was something like that. Mm. The trouble is, you can't. What you could do with a novel is you can end it. There it was in its end. Um, but life doesn't end for you like that. I mean, I'm pleased to say that life did not end for me <laughs> at the Booker Prize. But then you go, I remember saying, you know, um, the wonderful thing about this is the strongest feeling I have is relief. That's done now. Yeah. And I'll never think about the Booker Prize again. I hated thinking about the Booker Prize. I wanted to be a writer. I didn't want to win prizes. But then you get sucked in and you see there are these prizes and other people are winning prizes. And you think, well, if he could I shouldn't win a prize. Before you know where you are, you're caring about the Booker Prize. And I spent a lot of time caring about the Booker Prize. I mean, very rude about the prize, too. Abomination is what yeah. you called it. Did I call it an abomination? Yeah. The, least, the least of the things I could have called it. <laughs> and, then, and then I thought, well, that's it. You know, it's one now. I remember saying to my wife, it's a huge relief. And I promise you this, you will never hear me talking about the Booker Prize again. And I will never care whether I'm, you know, whether I win it again. And then you write another novel. <laughs> and you do care. I'm sure. And you do care. And, uh, and, and, 
and at one time to have been shortlisted would have been, you know, all right. And Jay was shortlisted. Um, but when you want it being shortlisted, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not. I've just this put on record, the biggest travesty of all is that Kaluki Knights did not win the Man Booker Prize. I will just say that because it's, it's one of my favourite novels. Uh, you know, the past 30 years. That's the second very true thing you've said to me. <laughs> I think we've got time for a few more questions and then and then we, we should finish. Well, in fact, time for one more question. I do apologise. Um, Howard obviously will be available uh, to sign books that you, will, you can buy uh, after this question. And I should say there's been some confusion in Anthony's book, which I have yet to read, but from all accounts, and I've only yet to read it because I've been busy writing it until this minute, really, um, my Charlotte book and now something else I'm on. But from all accounts, I hear it's extremely, an extremely good book. And, you know, how many books are there about Jesus? <laughs> so you should talk to him and say, you know, please send me one. Here's the money. Here's the money. Please send me one. It is, it is, of course, a Jewish book about football. It's the shortest book on record. <laughs> Last question. And then, as I say, how it will be available for um, book signings. There's a gentleman there. Um, oh, there's the Gentile sports writer. Yes, that'd be nice to hear from How am I? How, don't you think it's remarkable that I can just look up there like that and see a Gentile sports writer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Am I wearing a badge? <laughs> just, um, you give off something. <laughs> Confidence, I think. Happiness, <laughs> contentment. And a, and a sense that you are at home in the world. <laughs> I so envy you that. Sorry, you had a question. Um, well, yeah, you won't be surprised. My question is about sport. Um, and I'm just wondering if you accept the premise that um, sport for minority groups can be a great thing in sort of doing away with prejudice, raising their profile. I mean, I'm thinking of the likes of Muhammad Ali, um, the great Arthur Ashe, who you know, he's one of my all-time great heroes, uh, just an absolutely amazing human being. Um, the Williams sisters, um, you know, the black power salutes at the Olympic Games. And I, I, I can't help but feel that sport has played a huge part for black people um, in doing away with prejudice, um, the whole civil rights movement, etc., etc. And so I'm just wondering um, whether the same could be done for Jews, and you should be encouraging, like our, our friend from the Maccabee Games um, is arguing. Um, um, so really, I'm just wondering whether you think that sport can be a vehicle for doing away with prejudice and helping minority groups. In that well, way. it clearly can, and everything you've, you know, one can't contest anything that you've just said, but we don't, one could go back to the old stereotype argument again, and say, hasn't it also, you know, resulted in our feeling black people are very good at sport, black people are very good boxers, black people are very good. There's always a, there's always a danger of that once you once you excel, excel at something. I, I give the wrong impression if you think that you know if if I were to run into a, to a Jewish boy who was good at sport, I would try to dissuade him. I wouldn't dream of doing that. Um, but if I run into a Jewish boy who isn't good at sport, I would put my arms around him, kiss him on the forehead, and say, I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> and there is uh, an even greater life ahead of you. But read the late Henry Jones. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, thank you. Have a good